All right, Robert, let's dig right in. Who is Robert and what is Richter? Um, yeah, so just, I mean, look, we, myself, I'm a founder CEO. I've been an uh, entrepreneur since I was 21 years old and, and uh, thereabouts, really, really probably since I was 14. But um, I started Richter 15 years ago and uh, and it was my third company at the time, but uh, started it because I was, you know, at the time tinkering with different ideas online about what, you know, how to increase reputation and brand and web. And that was really taken out at the time in, in 2008. And so we actually started doing a lot of just brand reputation. And, but I had this idea to have an agency and I happened to know about a company that a guy came to speak to me in when I was in college and uh, he came to our, our college and he was actually from Hill. No, not, not Hill Hall. It was an agency he was from. And anyway, it had an impression on me. And, and I thought, you know, creative, I love that space. I love, um, I like ideas and, and art and aesthetics and things like that. And, and I love writing. And so long story short, basically Richter kind of evolved and we ended up, you know, sort of blending all my interests with writing and B2B sales and, you know, how to support those things. And it kind of evolved into that over the years. So now today, you know, we, we essentially consult and, and, and support large B2B companies, Fortune 500 companies with their end-to-end B2B sales journey with pre-sales and sales enablement training and customer experience and just solving problems within those things creatively and, and, and you know, using aesthetics, using communication to, to get those things done. So that's essentially who Richter is. We've, um, like I said, been around for 15 years. We've done about 8,000 plus, um, you know, video projects alone and, and um, have about $130 uh, billion plus customers. So you, uh, you mentioned evolution, uh, of your business, which I can imagine being that it's been over a decade is, has been, there's been quite a few of them. How how has, how has Richter evolved since its inception? I mean, that, that is very interesting because what I, what I learned is that, you know, you don't always end up where you started off. So when you look at the company, like you may start, I think the most important thing to a lot of people who are starting companies as well is like, just be a little bit more pliable and flexible because that's kind of what happened with me. It was like when we, when, when I started Richter, it, it just, there was a simple idea that we had a simple product to sort of pitch and sell. And it was, we called it web, web media PR, in fact, and we built like web media PR campaigns and charged a insignificant amount of money essentially. Oh. And and I just called my Rolodex. Like literally I had, I had saved all the business cards that I had from all these different contexts over the years in a binder. And that's literally where I started. It was like just emailing them to say, Hey, here's who we are and here's what we're doing. And I still have those emails. And then, and then just calling and letting them know like, Hey, here's, here's who we are and what we're doing. And sure enough, in the first five days of business, uh, we closed two customers for $2,000, you know? And, uh, and it was like, okay, that's enough to get us through to the next week, you know? And, and, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was completely bootstrapped, you know? And, and so we kind of did that. And the first month we ended up doing $30,000 in the first year, we ended up doing like 400,000. Um, yeah, it was a place to start, you know? And then, but, but the, going back to the question of evolution, it, it continued to evolve based off customers needs and, and what was working for them and what wasn't. And so as we were sort of doing things, we were like, Oh, you know, they, they need help with this and then they need help with this and they need help with this. And then at some point, as we start pivoting, we were like doing that. And then we had this social media press kit thing we created. And then we had, you know, this reach system to help support um, demand gen. And then it kept evolving. And each time I would kind of zero in on on what we called the target public. So when we looked at the database of the kinds of customers we were working with that worked extremely well for Richter, I, I kept sort of obsessively Every, every like six months, I would like zero in on that and like, like sort of focus in. And, and I started to see, oh, it, it's really B2B tech of like where, where we're winning and where, what's working for us and what's working for them. And so then we would, we would fine tune and focus into that. And then we would solve the problems related to what they need. And then um, it kept growing. And next thing you know, it started pushing into oh, now we're working with SAP or now we're working with HP. And then it kept going and it was like a process of elimination a little bit. Like we actually, there was multiple times where we cut whole swaths of customers Hmm. and we were like, just nope, you know, just cutting 
we even had a subscription service at the time and we went through the customers one by one and told them we're canceling it and we're getting and we're turning this off and we're not doing this anymore and um and so basically it just kept evolving into i think more and more of who we are and more and more of what serves the customer better and and also kind of where you want to go because you end up having needs and 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 ideas and things where you feel like your skill sets fit best just things that you naturally wake up and go i like to do this you know like right. like more, i think more than just somebody saying i have a checkbook let me pay you at least this is true for me i i like to be happy in the space that i'm in and be doing stuff that keeps my interest and stuff that i feel is relevant and solving a bigger and bigger problem so it was kind of the pursuit of like for what we do, let's rec- make Richter mission critical to our customers as much as we can and keep trying to solve the biggest, most important problems possible for the people that we, people and companies that we like to work with. And that was, that just kept evolving. But we, you know, we evolved ma- multiple times over the years and, and just kept kind of pivoting and changing, not drastically, um, but, you know, it, it continues that way. What, what are some of the things that you had to stop doing? on the journey well i mean like you know today they call it reputation management but we we were actually fairly successful with reputation management we called it just web pr but there was a lot of people that had we would deal with these customers that um you know like they would have some finra fine or something like that would be like a financial firm that had some fine from finra and they'll be showing up in the third result on google and then there'd be some other company that like kept getting bad reviews (laughs) it was like and we realized like, you know, we can't like it, like, for example, if, if a company is not going to service their customers correctly, you can't, um, you can't reputation manage that. No, no. <laughs> and so like we started looking at the profile and like the kinds of customers that needed reputation management. Yeah. And we were like, you know, uh, I think we're going to walk away from this, you know? And, uh, yeah. it's, it's funny cause it's, it's frustrating, you know, and, and we, our heart was always in the right place on it. And, um, but it was almost like you're adopting problem childs to, to some degree. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, it's like you, uh, you start off with this, this mission and this purpose of, of who you want to be and how you want to serve and, and, uh, little things come up like that where, yeah. You know, you're either going to stay on that exact mission and do things that might be a little bit counter to your human nature, right? Or you're going to shift your business towards you know something else. So that's that's a really that's a really good example. Any, anything else like that? Yeah, that, that came up. I, I think just uh, it it was it was things where they were like dead ends. You, you know how you start doing something and and sometimes you think you know no, this is not exactly what I wanted to be and it would be kind of a dead end and it's not going the way you want it to go exactly and and. Something about, you know, you know, the word alignment, that's something to talk about t- today a lot. I think that when you look at, if you think about art, I, I, I took art all through school and, and through high school and everything like that. And, and when you do, when you paint something, there's a point of view that you paint from. So everything would, would sort of align with that point of view when you paint something. And I think companies that way, when you have a, you have a vision and you have a mission and then everything should align with that vision and mission, I th- Theoretically, including even just each deal that you do. If a deal is not closing, something about it is not aligned. You've got the wrong mm-hmm. person or it's not the right offering or you're not solving a problem. So if you get it aligned, you're going to close the deal. And and, and I think alignment is a super sacred thing in a company. And so I basically it's a process of, of elimination based off alignment. Like you can sort of feel when something's not aligned. It could be somebody that's working for you. And you got to get rid of that person because somehow they're not aligned. And it's the same thing with a product or service that you're selling. I think when you're doing something and something about it is not aligned with where you're trying to go, maybe it was initially or you thought it was or it was a good idea, but it's not monetizing. It's not going the right way. It's not solving the customer's problem the way you want it to go. I I think mostly you should kill those, um, you know, and then and then move into things that they, they flow. You know, they're, 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 they're flowing like water because, because it's, it's aligned. Right. Well, do you have any examples on, on your team of when you've, when you've experienced maybe that lack of alignment or or misalignment and, and persistence towards, towards alignment led to just a significant breakthrough at Richter? Well, I, I mean, just with my ex-business partner, I mean, we, I think that was the number one thing we, 
we started the company together and, um, he's a good guy. Um, it's it. And what I, what I realized was it, we just weren't aligned, you know, and, and, and we would talk about things and, and it was, you know, you might say that we were on the same page or we were looking at the same picture, but I knew in my heart that we weren't because he had a picture in his mind that he kind of was working toward or had the way he would speak would be things that he, they went in a different direction than me. Like for me, I'm like, let's go build a thousand person agency and like solve this exact problem for the, you know, B2B largest B2B companies on the planet that, that do these exact mm-hmm. things and let's blow it out and let's build it big. And then we'll go buy out every other company that we can. Right. And, and so somebody might speak, but then their actions are misaligned. And so eventually it just got to the point where it was like, okay, let's talk about a buyout essentially. And, and it, 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 it got a little tense, but ultimately it was a good solution. And, and I ended up buying him out and then he went on and did his own agency. Um, and, he, and I, I don't keep up, but from what I understand, it's, it's moving more in the direction of what aligns with what he wants to do. And with Richter, we like, we, it was like, it was like cutting, you know, it was like cutting a, a resistance. And then we were like spring loaded after that, like after that yeah. happened, it like freed up everything. And we went like, you know, the stats went up the next year, we hit more revenue, we did better, you know, and it just felt, it felt like it was, you, you got sort of a, an anchor off the line to some degree, you know, and I think that it's not that he's trying to sabotage or destructive. And this is true of him or any other person. I think if you're not aligned on a team, like if you're in a rowboat and, and, and you got three people rowing and you're in the last thing and you're kind of like, maybe we should go over here and you're kind of rowing <laughs> over right. there, the three in the front are going to go, dude, really? You know, like, yeah. can you just row at the same se- sequence time that we're rowing? Like we're going this way, you right. know, and, and it's such a drag. It's like exhausting, you know? Well, and, and to, to not to overuse your, your analogy, but like jumping out of the boat would get you there faster than somebody in the back right. rowing against the, the, the motion. Right. So, right. you know, sometimes it may feel like, you know, we need all four of these people in order to get where we're going. But in reality, three can get there faster than four. Right. Um, So that's that's cool. And and to hear about what your business partner went on to go do something that aligned with what with his pursuits and and his human drive. Right. That's cool. That that it's not like he fell out of the boat and then drowned. Right. It's like he found his own boat. Right. That's right. So, yeah, that's that that's very cool to hear stories like that. And I think there's yeah. I've had to let go of and, and part ways from or however you want to you know talk about business partners, yeah. co-founders before. And it's hard. It's really hard because yeah. yeah, it, it is because you you build a tight relationship. You know, your 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 brothers or your sisters or, you know, whatever, like wh- whoever it is that like you have that dynamic of family almost. And it's like, um so it, it's really tough, right? Because it's a business and it's not a family, right. and and um, it, but it could be like a family a little bit. So it's like it's it's gut wrenching sometimes to have to go through that, and then it can get it can get like a little heated, and 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 it's unfortunate, you know, because it it does kind of burn bridges. But I think sometimes it, it's for the best, not just for you, but also for them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's switch gears here for a second um, and talk about enterprise sales because that's that's your jam. That's my jam. Like I, I I love talking about all things growth, especially as it relates to selling to big companies and selling big deals. So, like, talk to me a little bit about the problems that you're solving for your clients. Obviously, a little bit different demographic than we're where my business sits from a, you know, size perspective, but talk to me about some of the problems that you guys are solving and, uh, and the results that you're seeing. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, when, when customers come to us, it's, it, it, it's usually the same things. Like it's, there's problems in, in pre-sales and by pre-sales, I just simply mean there's an audience they're trying to get after there. There's an exact people that they're trying to get after. And, and it would start by profiling those exact people. So when you look at, in any B2B sale, we're really just talking about human to human, H to H. And, and there's an element of like, OK, first of all, who are we going after? And number two, what are they you know, w- what are the pain points or problems or challenges that they're trying to solve? And, and how can we speak to those things? So, number one, identify them. Number two, un- understand where they are, where they are online. How do we connect with them? How do we get to them? Number three, what's the messaging? What, what's going to resonate with these kinds of people, these exact people? 
And then, mm-hmm. and then what is the flow of actions? Like, what is that sort of journey or those breadcrumbs of like, how are you going to sort of pervade, you know, like get, get, how are we going to get to these people and like get their attention and then route them into sales? And so that's, that's sort of what we would call pre-sales is step one is like getting their attention in the first place. A lot of companies, even if they're really big companies, battle obscurity. So that's problem number one of like getting the right attention from the right people. And most companies, companies, when we talk to those companies, they're not saying, Hey, let's throw out a giant net. They're saying we need to get to very specific people in very specific roles in very specific companies. Right. And so it's, it's more of a surgical approach to go, like we're targeting exact people. And that could be something like a, a LinkedIn ad campaign. It could be a series of content strategy. It could be a series of just mapping all, all the assets and everything we need or thought leadership, or whatever. And then once we have their attention, it's it's looking at how do we support the sales journey? How do we support the sales people to make sure that they're taking that from A to B to actually close a deal? And, and so a big part of it is just mapping those various different journeys, mapping out the messaging, mapping out the content. How do you sort of how do you create the journey to make it as simple as possible to arrive at a closed deal? Um, and, you know, I have different views on, on how you need to do that as somebody who's in B2B sales, like as what, what those people should do. A lot of the responsibility that we have as an agency is actually to help support the, the, the pre-sales and sales journey and training of the team to make their life a lot easier. So like taking t- taking Apple as an example, when you think about like, Apple, you would have a, a keynote event and then it pushes over to like, you've got the new product they launch and then you have this beautiful like Apple Ultra page for the Apple uh, Watch, right? And it's like, it just takes you right through it. You're like, order. Y- you want to kind of emulate that on the B2B space and kind of go, how do we how do we put all the steps in the right uh, sequence so it flows into sales and through sales in the easiest possible way. And what ends up happening a lot of times is that what's it's very fragmented. So I, I need an asset that says this, and I need a deck that says this, and I need blah, 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 that says this. But reality right. is, it's like everything kind of happens in a flow and in a journey. And so we want to orchestrate those steps to sort of move it to the to, to each step, one after the next, to arrive where they need to arrive and then arm the team with everything they need. And what we know in B2B is a lot of B2B sales folks follow up on average three times, but it can take 18, 19, 25 plus contacts to close a deal. And you go, well, why are they following up three times? You go, well, call reluctance. They run out of assets. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to handle things, whatever. Um, how can we orchestrate the process with everything that they need so they're they're able to stay the course and incle- increase the, the, the probability of closing deals? Mm-hmm. Um, these are the kinds of things that we work with our customers on to, to help them do that. And in a very large company, you have a huge amount of salespeople. So you kind of run into Pareto's law of like 20% doing 80% of the work. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're trying to help the 80% do more in many cases, the 20% yeah. know what they're doing. Um, the 20% are usually like, they're fine. They're good. You know, <laughs> they're doing yeah. what they do. Um, you know, and, and, what we want to do is increase efficiency and, and, and productivity and the probability that things are going to close or things are going to happen. But having said all that, it could be a myriad of things like companies are working on, you know, go to market strategy or they're working on a trade show or they're working on a product launch. And so sometimes it just means that we're coming in and, and helping support um, whatever's coming up. But I always use the same method of like, let's start with the outcome. The, the objective, mm-hmm. what are we trying to do? And then let's define the approach of how we're going to get there. And then the tactics are within the approach. And what's the approach that you're usually getting brought into uh, most com- most commonly? Well, I mean, I, I mostly it's pre-sales. I would say like nine times out of 10, it's pre-sales. It, it's, it's, it's the, the nonstop problem of we need to get in front of more people and drive more people into sales. Like that's, sure. um, that's probably problem one. I mean, it comes up with every single company that you ever talk to and you can, t- you can go through all these different areas, training, customer experience and everything. But the main thing is there, most companies are trying to figure out how to get in front of more people and drive more people in sales, even though sales in many cases are muffing it and they have a ton of opportunities and they're, they're you know, whatever they're, it's like, there, there's always a ton the there. Yeah, always yeah, the top of the bottle. Yeah, always the top of the bottle. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah, we call pre sales, but but yeah, t- exactly. Like some people call it top of funnel, and and it's like that is the constant, you know. Uh, and and what what are some of the most common things that are good starting points for you as you're as you're helping them get more eyeballs, as you're helping them, you know, yeah. get 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 more pre sales. <laughs> I, honestly, I think it's so simple. I think a lot of it is so simple. It comes down to you've you've got to obsessively study and understand who you're going to. And the more you know about the person, like it, when you think about B2B sales at a high level, the more you know about the person, the more you can communicate the right message on on email, but also just on text and then actually phone calls. The more you understand that person, the easier it gets. Because then you can, like, I actually think the most effective method is a direct one-to-one approach of like, a direct outreach one-to-one approach to those exact people with the right assets at the right time, that's going to be the most effective. So if you're going after the chief revenue officer of, you know, a $10 billion company, know who that person is, know what challenges they have, understand them, like understand what's going on in the company and bring a relevant offer, bring a relevant solution to that person and then take a one-to-one outreach approach and don't, don't wait for inbound. You can do a lot of inbound. You can do a lot of things to like, get their attention and route them in. Those, those are all super, super helpful. The best thing you could possibly do is a one-to-one direct outreach approach. Yeah. It's funny when I, when I talk to a business and, um, you know, ask about personas, right. Which is kind of what you're getting at. And, and the, the answer is, uh, the persona is the CRO of a company between 5 million and 500 million in revenue. It's like, yeah. okay, well, that's not really a persona. That's that's a role yeah. at a business, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, what do they care about? Where do you yeah. find them, right? That's kind of what you're getting at here. And yeah. um, so it's it's interesting that a lot of the pain points that you deal with with billion-dollar companies, you know, are the same exact ones that, that I'm dealing with with million-dollar companies, totally. right? Uh, totally. So what, you know, what, what – um, what what other commonalities uh, are you, are you seeing um, as it relates to pre sales and, and marketing? Well, um, you know, I, I I think, I mean, at least at the billion dollar size, you know, I, I think I think thought leadership comes up a lot. I like I think thought leadership is a big thing. A lot of companies are trying to find ways to get more attention, more eyeballs all the time, you know. And and I just saw yesterday or two days ago that Cisco was going to be turning, I think, I forget the number. I, I hate to overstate it, but I think it was like 38,000 employees to all be LinkedIn, uh, to, to all yeah, be I LinkedIn, saw that. LinkedIn influencers. Yeah, right, LinkedIn I influencers. I was like, I was like, isn't that wild? Um, but that comes up meanwhile, a lot. Meanwhile, other companies won't let you have a LinkedIn. Right, right. And I, but I like, we were talking to, I'm not going to name names necessarily, but we were talking to a customer and we were dealing, we're dealing with the CEO of that company and doing a lot of their internal communication work for alignment. And that, like, we were talking about that exact topic of like, yeah. like LinkedIn thought leadership. And, um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's not just a novelty. It's like, it's important, these things. And they're, they're really, it's important that people have influence and have some thought leadership there and are doing, making the right moves. And I think today in 2023, the funny thing is, you know how you, you say, well, what's the one thing or what's the best strategy or what's this and that? I've always said, I really think it's compound. It's a compound approach. It's like, unfortunately, you're going to have to do all of these things. You're going to have to do the direct response, one-to-one outreach work. You're going to have to do the thought leadership. You're going to have to do the ad strategy. You're going to have to do map the journey and route them in. I, I think it's all of those things. And I think that the thing that's going to work is, is a compounded approach and making sure that you have a very thorough compounded approach to all these different things. And that's, that's ultimately what it takes. I think every time we close a deal, I always think, man, that took like eight times more than I thought it would take, you know? Yeah. Like, like I'm thinking it should have closed like back here at this stage. And, uh, and I am often blown away by how many meetings, phone calls, zooms, emails, and iterations of the proposal it takes to close a single deal from a company that knows us and that we are right. already a known quantity and we've already done the work and, right. and then it finally closes and you're like, wow, you know? And, and so for me, I guess one thing I would just say to everybody is like, increase your sort of like estimation of effort and, and, and overshoot everything, mm-hmm. you know? 
Yep, I do. I do know. And on that same note, you know, when you um, when you're approaching the the various let's call it, like various stages of the sales journey, does that differ depending on the industry and, and size of the clients that you're dealing with, or is is it fairly consistent? You know, like how what are, what are you seeing as it relates to that? I mean, for our for our own sales journey it's been the same and we've, we've kept that process the exact same. And I still follow it to this day. And so we're, we're pretty methodical about our, our sales journey and how it works. But, but for them, you do, you do want to cater to the company. I don't think, I don't think there's necessarily one size fits all. Having said that in B2B, it's probably going to be pretty similar. It's, it's going to be probably pretty similar to what I said. Some people do it a little differently. Like, you know how people go into, and you go on link, you go on Salesforce and it says, da da da, and then qualify like lead and then qualification and blah, blah, blah. You know, so however you want to do it. But I have my view on how that sales process actually works. And I think that if you ask smart questions, like if you go talk to the sales team, the B2B sales team, especially the the, the best reps that are doing well, and you say, okay, so here's the closed contract. Um, what happened right before that? Well, I did this and I talked to da, da, da. Cool. What happened right before that? What happened right before that? What happened right? And you start to dissect yeah. it. Then you could start sort of like you talk to a bunch of different reps and you started to dissect it. You'll get a clear picture of like, what does that actual sales process look like for this company? And then you can kind of map it and build what I would consider to be a repeatable model. And that's what you want. You don't want people just going, oh, I do it like this because um, that's going to hurt consistency and, and, and outcomes. And it's hard to manage that, too, because if you do have an exact sales process and you say, OK, so you, you've sent the proposal you can manage it better by saying, okay, let's, so now we're in proposal review and we got to execute that step, you know, but if you don't have that, it's hard to even navigate it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it changes a little bit based off the company. And I, but I, 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 I do think there's somewhat of a universal process for B2B. Yeah. And, and, and you're standing these, these programs up, but, but it, it's not like you're just kind of standing it up once and then, and then not learning from it. Right. I mean, at least right. I, I guess I'm assuming that that's not the case, but there's probably yeah. this, le- this level of continuous improvement that you guys adopt with your clients. Correct. Yeah. 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 And the other thing in that sales process, by the way, is you also have to cascade down the, the, the sub actions within each stage. So when you think about, okay, you're at discovery, it's like, Okay, good. That's a general stage, but what is the cascaded steps within discovery that need to be executed every time? You know. Yeah. So, so, so walk me through that. So, yeah, obviously you, you got your stages of the sales journey, and then you're yeah. talking about you know the actions, whether those actions be internal or external, that you're making as part of yeah. moving from stage to stage, gate to gate, if you will. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What are some of the common gates that companies are are often missing? Well, I mean, I would say, I mean, look, I mean, one of the things, number one in B2B selling, number, I mean, number one, the first thing that comes to mind is, is just not having the right person, like going to the wrong person and, and not like, so people talk about qualif- qualifying for that. I don't use that terminology necessarily, but it, but it is true. It's like, if you start in B2B with somebody who's not the stakeholder or not the person who's, who's going to be the right person for the deal, what's going to happen in B2B is there's, as you know, uh, you know, as you know, there's, you have a great call with somebody and then they have to go take that pitch, take the thing that you just talked about, and they're going to have to go to someone else who is the stakeholder, let's say, or a degree down from the stakeholder, and you're hoping that they're going to pitch it the way you pitched it, and then right. represent it. But really, it's just going to—they're going to give them a number. They're going to go, uh, "It's it's fifty thousand or whatever," and the person's going to go, fifty thousand? What? Who is it for? No, we're not doing that. Uh, you know. <laughs> so. Um, so I think that's that. I mean, that's fundamental problem number one. So it like if you can get it on the rails from the very beginning, in other words, when you have a discovery, you have a discovery with the right person as step one. So getting good at doing the homework and research and understand who is the right person, actually, because if you end up trying to go down and hopefully go up and get to the next person, first of all, your sales cycle is going to take very long. As we know, time wounds all deals and it's just going to get you're going to it's going to get eaten away as you go. Um, and then the reality is you don't even know if the person you're dealing with is going to be able to confront and, and handle the person that, that needs to get confronted and handled essentially in terms of closing a deal. Right. And and, right. and probably not. So um, that's probably the number one thing that bugs 
all B2B sales cycles. Yeah, you know? no, that's, that's, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, it, it, I see that all the time. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and, and you guys, you guys, um, if I look at your website, you've got kind of things quartiled into four areas of focus, right? right? You've got pre-sales, which you've talked about sales yeah. enablement, yeah. internal communication and training, yeah. and then customer experience is, yeah. is that really like, if I were to dial it down and say, what does Robert do on a day to day? Robert yeah. and his team is that is that those four quadrants kind of you know yeah. what you do totally uh, the reason the reason those exist when you think about it in, in layman's terms when you think about pre sales you're just trying to get the attention of the audience and, and you're trying to route them into sales and then from a marketing however you want to look at it so you're just trying to get the attention and the outcome is you're trying to route them in sales and then in quadrant two when you're when you're selling you're trying to help the team close those deals arrive at a closed deal and then and then in training internal calm you're trying to make sure the team is aligned and they're performing the way they need to perform. So they're getting the outcomes they're trying to get. And then in quadrant four with the customer experience, you're trying to make it sticky so they stay because we just invested all this money in trying to get this right. customer and sell them and train the team to do it the right way. And now we just want to make sure that the customer is happy and they stay around. So when we think about the end to end B2B sales journey, these are not just ideas, those quadrants. These are what come up all the time. So after like literally like thousands of conversations with companies, these areas come up constantly. And when I look at the, the, the ideal, like if I had carte blanche and, and the customer say, here's a couple million bucks, just do whatever you want to do. I'd be like, great. You know, and we would just, we would just do, you know, make those quadrants ideal, the journeys within those quadrants completely ideal. So all the journeys were mapped and we had every component part we needed to just build a better B2B sales journey. And, um, that's going to make everybody's life easier. So how, how do you measure the success of all of these services in a client interventions in a client sales journey? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, that's a good question, you know, because it's like, you know how there's companies out there that are like, you know, there's the elevator pitch, like the one sentence, tell me who you are. Hmm. Richter's not that company. Uh, if we have five or six minutes, we can say, oh, here's who we are. You know, it's kind of like you think about an Accenture, um, companies like that, they're kind of have complex offerings. Even IBM to this day, it's, it's difficult to sort of articulate who they are and what they do. Um, and I, I see Richter a little bit that way. And so when I look at the, when I look at the problems we're solving, we're a hybrid to help support the end end B2B sales journey and get the various outcomes or, or the problems that we're solving at the time. And when I look at the ROI outcome, we survey every customer after every single project or every single thing that we do. And we get a lot of feedback. And I, I would say the ultimate ROI is the resign. We have we have probably a 90% resign rate with customers and they're 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 raving fans, you know. And internally at Richter, we obsess over stellar products and a world-class customer experience. And we really every day we talk about this. And so we're always doing surveys and doing things to collect data from customers and just understand we get a lot of feedback from customers and they tell us you guys are just easy to work with and you just get it done. And you understand us. We've had, um, you know, there was a billion dollar company we were dealing with recently and they said they had a very large agency they were working with and they had the creative chops, but they really didn't understand their space. They really didn't understand what they did. And with us, it's like we live and breathe B2B end to end sales. And so there's an element where, the ROI is just the intrinsic value of Richter all by itself. Now, we don't go to the degree of like, let's measure all these metrics. And I don't even know that we can necessarily because a lot of the time they're taking these different component parts or the things that we're doing and we're coordinating with an internal team. So we, we could gather it from them, I suppose, if we really wanted to, but we generally don't. We Sometimes we get some stats and things like that, but most of the customers come back. We have a high resign rate. We have our service, the feedback that we get is fantastic. Like we get a lot of actual written feedback on, you know, daily. And that's kind of how we measure the success. I mean, we could probably do a better job of like digging in and here's this metric that says, here's the exact ROI. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good thing. Um, but I, I, I also think that our, uh, it's kind of our reputation, you know, we've really built a reputation. Um, and, and when we have the calls, the customers know that we know, you know, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I do know. So, um, all right. I want to, one, one last question before we hop into the founder five and it's kind of about, you know, the future of Richter and the future yeah. of Robert. So yeah. where, where are you going next, buddy? 
Um, you know, well, we have a couple companies. So we have we have Richter, and then we have Content One, which is still it's still growing. Content One deals with mid market B two B companies, and it has a very exact thing that it does as a market retainer. And we just solve these two problems that come up all the time: obscurity and the the sales journey for B two B companies. So that's growing. You know, that company's you know, uh, you know, doing pretty well and starting to really grow. And then we have another company called RP that handles Richard Productions, which handles all the live production work. So we're really working to do more films and documentaries and things like that with that company. And that's starting to get some legs. Um, and then RGC is the company that I actually work with, Richter Group of Companies. And and the, the vision there is actually find companies that align with Richter and with what we're trying to do and buy them out and hmm. um, and build somewhat of an ecosystem. So we have everything that we need and we have really the strongest group of companies to solve the various different problems for these companies. So we are the most qualified player in our space. And um, that's, I mean, I'm a builder, right? You know, if you put me on the beach, I'm going to be building a sandcastle. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like yeah. I, I, you know, for what's next is like build the vision, you know, build keep the dream. Going. And yeah, yeah. Keep, keep going. Yeah. All right. That's awesome, man. All right. So let's hop into the founder five. The first question for you is number one metric or KPI that you are relentlessly focused on. I mean, I want to say, I, I, I mean, the entrepreneur and the CEO in me wants to say gross income. It's like, that's the, <laughs> it's the thing. I, it's always, but recently I've been thinking more about the, the, the percentage of, you know, the income divided by our employees, like, like how efficient are we being as a company? So very recently it's kind of shifted from gross income to gross income divided by employees. So I can measure how productive and efficient we're being per person. Um, I think that's what I should be focused on. And that's what, so I'm starting to, I'm starting to move more there. Well, that's, that's a good one. In fact, in a hundred episodes, not one person has used that one yet. So you can have that one. And I love that one. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, next one is top tip for growth stage founders like yourself. Certainty. I, I think, I think having more certainty in yourself and just, just, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I would say you got to trust yourself. You've got to trust yourself and you've got it. You're going to get a lot of naysayers. You're going to get doubters. You're going to get doubters. You're going to get people say they challenge you and everything's like that. Listen to yourself internally, really listen to yourself and, 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 and do what motivates you when you wake up and you go, what is it that you want to do? Forget scaling, forget scaling. When you think about the greatest companies, they, 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 they obsessively built, they were obsessed with building the best product, the best company possible. And by doing that, they scaled. So the question is, what is it that's compelling for you? That's going to drive you. That's going to help you do what you want to do. And, 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 and is trust yourself on that, lean into that, just relentlessly stay the course on that thing. Um, and, and I think by and large that that's the thing that's going to lead to scale. I think, I, I think obsessing sometimes on the metrics and how do we scale? How do we scale? All the great companies I've ever learned and known and read, they scale by being great and by following a vision and a gut instinct and 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 pushing that into existence, um, and and not not playing this game of like should I should I not should I should I not and listen to this person listen yeah. to that person listen to that, you know and you can get right. kind of spun out. So I think that uh, that's a good that's a really good one. All right, um, favorite book or podcast that's helped you to grow as an entrepreneur. Um. Okay. So the book, I mean, I have it on my desk right now. I, I like this book. I like, I like, I like the ride of the lifetime or ride, ride of, of a lifetime, lifetime. By Bob Iger. Um, he's probably my favorite CEO right now. Like when I think about great CEOs and I, that, that yeah. book, I, I really think Bob Iger is fantastic. And, uh, I don't think he gets enough spotlight. I think there's, there's people out there that are like really like in the spotlight and really in PR, but I actually think Bob Iker is one of the greatest CEOs and leaders of our time. Um, so I would say that. And then, um, podcast, I, I listen to a few, I like Lewis Howes. I like, I like Tim Ferriss. Um, I, I kind of change up. Sometimes it depends on what I am interested in. So if I'm listening to, I'm interested in merged and acquisitions or private equity, or I'm listening to sales or whatever, I try to find stuff that's relevant, you know, or if I, you know, uh, Sir, uh, Martin Sorrell, I was listening to recently, the guy who's, you know, helped build uh, WPP and now he's doing S4 capital. And I like to go to like, when I'm trying to find data on stuff, I like to listen to things and 
And uh, I think, um, yeah, I, so sometimes like an episode like that might be on Lewis Howes or Tim, Tim Ferriss or some other thing, but th- those yeah. are pretty good. Those are common, I think. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. All right. Um, piece of advice that counters traditional wisdom. Hmm. Um, that's interesting that it counters traditional wisdom. Um, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, this probably is traditional wisdom. This probably is traditional. You know how you watch the TikToks or, or I don't have TikTok, but it shows up on, it shows up on YouTube and there's that kid that asks all those people that drive cars and says, what do you do? Or, you know, yeah. love your car, what do you do? <laughs> if you compound all those answers, every single person says pretty much passion and work hard. And so this is probably kind of cliche, but the reality is it is simple. It's like, what are you passionate about? And then work your face off on that, yeah. you know? And I, I think that the, that's the advice. It's like all things that are actually truths generally are simple. Yeah, that's a good one. In fact, that might be your answer for the last one, which is what is going to be the title of your autobiography? Oh, no, the title of my autobiography is going to be uh, I Can't Help You, you know, because it's like, <laughs> Because I've, you, I want to write a book that talks about all these things, why I can't help you, you know, because all the things that people do, they're getting in their own way on success and they're all doing all these other things. And I'd like to just list out all the pitfalls and everything I've seen people do. And in an odd way, it would be a very informative book, book so people could go, okay, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm not going to be doing these things. I'm helping myself now. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's good. No, I, I like that one a lot. I like that one a lot. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> awesome, dude. Well, uh, you've given a ton to our listeners today, Robert. So I always like for a little bit of self promotion here at the end. How can how can those listening help you out? Um. Yeah. Look, follow me. Follow me on LinkedIn. You know, I I I've been you know boost my LinkedIn following, and that would be pretty cool. Um. Or share this episode. I would love for you to share this episode. That'd be great. Uh. It's always it's both ways. I uh, thank you for your time, and and it takes time from you, and it takes time from me, and and I I uh, but I've learned a lot from podcasts. I'm really thankful they exist. Uh. Because I always wanted to have a scenario when I was younger where I could listen to people who've done it, and kind of pull back the curtain and understand like, what did they do? And I, I love the authentic nature of podcast. So if you would share the podcast and you'd follow on, on LinkedIn, it's LinkedIn forward slash in, uh, forward slash Robert M Cornish. That would be awesome. Excellent. And that's the best way to get in touch with you is through LinkedIn. Yeah. Awesome, dude. All right. Well, you, uh, you rock. Thanks for joining us yeah. on the dirt and to the audience, you know, what Robert said, we took some time. We gave you some insights. We're doing this all the time. So we'd love to hear what you think and share it with a friend. And that's the goal of the dirt is the challenges and obstacles that come with growing a business. So thanks for joining us.